Okay, good evening, God bless. Welcome to our sixth session on supernatural healing. You can take your Bibles and turn to Exodus, please. Thir 15. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, I love you and I praise you and thank you for your grace and your mercy and your goodness to all of us and for being with us tonight and helping us to have... Uh, an alacrity of mind and open hearts and uh, an ability to receive with meekness the truths that are set before us tonight. Thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and for his redemption that was made available through him to us. And We love you and we praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We're going to talk about healthy living tonight. This might be hard for some of you to to handle, but uh, as we look into this subject and we discuss the things that we're going to tonight, I, it's important that we embrace, we continue to embrace that healing is a gift. All healing is because of God's mercy and His love, and that our God, as we saw in our last session, the first segment of our last session, our God is a very compassionate God, and He 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 empathizes with our with our plight, and has, has and he, he wants to alleviate our problems in life. He's on our side. He cares about us. He wants to help us. And anything we take to God, whatever it may be, any weakness or anything that we're struggling with, even if we're struggling with believing He exists, we can take that to Him, and He'll help us. Uh, so, having said that, if we want to enjoy a healthy life or receive healing, we must strive to eliminate the cause of the problems that are causing us to have an unhealthy life or to have the need for healing in our lives. There's two essentials for healthy living. They include faith and personal responsibility. And I, I have this chart here. I think it's in your syllabus. Uh, it's, we'll call it the healthy living chart, since healthy living is at the top of the chart. The very first thing is godliness, maintaining a, a godly life and having God at the center of your life. And then in no particular order, that's why it's in a circle. You see on the left-hand side, or maybe it's on the right-hand side as you're looking at the screen, nutrition. It's important to have good nutrition. And then on the opposite side is the environment, attitude, exercise, having a good health care provider, and then to expect the supernatural to come into our existence. These are the different, some of these things we're going to look at tonight at more length than others, but they're all, all of these components are necessary to have a healthy life. And, and wherever we cut on one or the other, we're going to suffer for it. The first thing I want to talk about is godliness. Godliness is living godly by obeying God's word. It's fundamental to a healthy life. Whereas sin and disobedience kind of assures sickness and disease. In Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, a verse of scripture that we have looked at many times before in the class. And he said, If you will give earnest heed to the voice of Yahweh your God and do what is right in His sight and give ear to His commandments and keep all of His statutes, I will put none of these diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians. For I, Yahweh, am your healer. I, I continue to go back to this because quite often... When a concept is first introduced into the scripture, it, it, it lays a foundation for every other place that that concept is talked about. Not always that way, but many times it is. And here we see that the, the first word in this verse is the word if. The word if places a condition. Uh, there's a stipulation, a requirement, a prerequisite that's being set forth. If you will, number one, give earnest heed to the voice of Yahweh your God. Listen to God. And 
Number two, do what is right. Then he repeats this in different words. Do what's right in his sight and give ear to his commandments. Again, that would be hearing it. And keep all of his statutes. I will put none of these diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians, for I, Yahweh, am your healer. So there is a stipulation there, and that is of hearing God's word and doing God's word. In Exodus 23, Exodus 23. I'm going to set before you principles of truth that it seems in the Scripture there's always an exception to these principles. Nonetheless, there are general principles that do hold true. I mean, I, here's a general principle, what you believe you receive. But that isn't always true. You know, if you, what you give, you get. That's a general principle that is generally true, but it's not always that way. So... Uh, so we're, you, you, I want you to understand that uh, we're not setting forth a legalistic perspective here, but rather a, a concept of truth that is consistent throughout the Scriptures. In Exodus 23, verse 20, Behold, I am going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way, to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Be on guard before him and obey his voice. Do not be rebellious toward him, for he will not pardon your transgressions since my name is in him. But if you truly obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. For my angel will go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Pedusites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will completely destroy them. You shall not worship their gods nor serve them, nor do according to their deeds, but you, will, you shall utterly overthrow them and break their sacred pillars in pieces. But you shall serve Yahweh your God, and He will bless your bread and your water, and I will remove sickness from your midst. There shall be no one miscarrying or bearing barren in the land. I will fulfill the number of your days and have a long life. And then it goes on from there. I will send my terror ahead of you, and throw into confusion all the people among whom you come. And I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. I will send hornets, and we've read this before. Yahweh will be on your side, and he'll have you to have a healthy, abundant life. And he'll take care of you, if you do what he says to do. Yahweh's promises to remove sickness from them, indicating his willingness for his people to enjoy wholeness. However, there is that stipulation. And again, what we looked at last week, how can we not continue to embrace this in our minds? Yahweh longs to be gracious to you. He, he really, really, really wants to be gracious to you. He longs to be gracious to you. And therefore, He waits on high to have compassion on you. For Yahweh is a God of justice. How blessed are all those who long for Him. I mean, to look at this verse in its entirety... I mean, last week we looked about, I wanted to show you how much he longed to be gracious to us. And, and he waits on high to have compassion. The reason he waits on high to have compassion is we have to allow him to have his compassion on us. He cannot bully his way into our lives. And that's why it says, for Yahweh is a God of justice. He's a God of justice, which means he won't break his own laws in order to, you know, bless you. He wants to bless you. He longs to bless you. He's got compassion. He wants to be gracious, but you have to allow him to do so. How blessed are all those who long for him? Because if you long for him, then he's going to take care of you. Yahweh's loving kindnesses, indeed, they never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. This is our wonderful God, and this is his, his attitude towards us. And remember, we saw this verse in Malachi 7.18, because he delights, he's delighted in mercy. And I showed you last week that mercy and compassion are very similar. He delights in having compassion to us. But we have to allow him into our lives. We have to open up our lives to him so that he may bless us. I mean, that's not a hard concept. This is a very easy concept. In uh, Deuteronomy, please turn to Deuteronomy. You know, there was a lot of kids in my neighborhood when my children were growing up. 
Um, but I didn't feed all of them. You know, I, I, felt, I fed the ones that were mine and that lived in my house that were in connection with me. And sometimes they're friends. Um, and that's kind of the way it is with Yahweh. I, I want to say this too, that quite often books and teachings regarding supernatural healing provide no recognition of personal responsibility. And I've read many books on healing. They don't talk about the, the personal responsibility that is there of the people who want to be healed. They, talk, they focus a lot of times on the supernatural and the, how to operate the power and so on. All healing is a gift of grace. There's no question about it. However, grace never implies that we don't have the requirements to receive by faith the gift that's set before us. And we know that, we know that through the scriptures that faith has in it, sort of intrinsic to it, is obedience to the, to the will of God. Expecting God's involvement in our life without personal responsibility, it contradicts the basic ideology, ideology of the Bible, not ideology, the ideology of the Bible. The ideology of the Bible is that people have to accept God and believe that God is God. <laughs> in Deuteronomy chapter 7, in verse 9, it says, Know therefore that Yahweh your God, He is God, the faithful God, who keeps His covenant and His love and kindness to thousand generations, to a thousandth generation with those who love him and keep his commandments, with those who love him and keep his commandment. But he repays those who hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not delay with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. Therefore you shall keep the commandment and the statutes and the judgments which I am commanding you today to do them. This is the way the program works. Then it shall come about, because you listen to these judgments and keep them and do them, that Yahweh your God will keep, you, his, keep with you His covenant and His loving kindnesses, which He swore to your forefathers. He will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground and your grain and your new wine and your oil and the increase of your herd and, your, and the young of your flock in the land which He swore to your forefathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all peoples. There shall be no male or female barren among you or among your cattle. Yahweh will remove from you all sicknesses, all sickness, and he will, put away, put, he will not put on you any of the harmful diseases of Egypt which you have known, but he will lay them on all who hate you. And again it goes on and elaborates further in this area. We're not talking, not, so we're talking about there is a basic requirement of obedience. And this hasn't changed with the New Testament, New Testament and the advent of Christ. It hasn't changed at all. That, you know, the, the scriptures are pretty clear throughout and consistent. As a matter of fact, it's very bold in the last book of the Bible uh, about the requirement for those of us to have if we want eternal life to have obedience to the principles that are set forth in the commandments in the Bible. Perfection is not the standard that I'm talking about or the scriptures are talking about. We're not talking about walking perfectly. Rather, walking in, in progressing in our, in our life with God and living with Him. We all sin, which is why forgiveness is part of our daily prayer. And that was Jesus' idea in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. It's not, we're not talking about a sinful, sinless existence, but we are talking about a life of godliness where we strive to be obedient to the commandments of God. A common deception is, again, a common deception in the church, not out of the church. The church doesn't even think these thoughts at all. In the church, there's a common deception that habitual sin and disobedience or rebellion does not cause problems. And, and that would be a strong indication of a lack of understanding of the Scripture. Because it starts in the very beginning in chapter 3. We see the devastating consequences of obedience. And it doesn't get, well, it gets a little, well, I don't know if it gets better. It keeps on going on. Chapter 6 is the flood. 
and, and so on it goes. You know, the other day I drove down to, to um, what's that mall all the way at the end of the road? Crossgate Mall. You know, they got all those movie theaters in there, and I was, I was uh, going to go to the movies, and there was a movie I wanted to see, and I went in to go into the movie, and, and I walked in, and there's a guy standing, and he wanted, he wanted a ticket. And I said, what do you mean you want a ticket? He said, you got, you know, give me your ticket. I said, I don't have a ticket. He said, well, then you can't come in. I said, what do you mean I can't come in? I want to go see the movie. He said, no, you got to have a ticket. Go down there and buy a ticket. I said, I ain't going to go buy no ticket. He said, well, you're not coming in. I said, well, I tell you what, I'm not going to come in. You know what I did? I drove home. I, said, I went home, and I just sat there, and I didn't go to the movies. I showed him. Nobody's telling me what to do. I do what I want to do whenever I want to do it. And nobody's telling me what to do. I, they didn't get my money because I didn't pay for it. That's right. Nobody tells me what to do. Proverbs chapter 1. I mean, that's how stupid we get. That's, a, that's, a, that's, I'm, you know, that's how stupid we are. We would rather do our own way and live our own way rather than being obedient to the commandments of God because we got rebellion in our heart and we're not going to do what God tells us to do. As if you know how life works. God knows. Do what he tells you. It's not, this is not hard stuff here. If you want to have a healthy, good life, do what God tells you to do. If you want to have a lousy life, do what you want to do. You don't have to go to the movie if you don't want to. Go home and watch reruns. You know I made that story up because I never go to the movies. The only time I go to the movies is when Mimi makes me go watch these Christian movies. So she knew right from the beginning it was a story. Proverbs chapter 1. We do have a choice. We can either... We, well, I, I skipped to chapter 30, didn't I, of Deuteronomy. We ought to read that. Deuteronomy 30. I tell these stories and I forget where I am. Deuteronomy chapter 30. And verse 15. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. It should be an easy choice here. And then I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, love Yahweh your God, walk in His ways and keep His commandments and His statutes and His judgments, that you may live and multiply, and that the Yahweh your God may bless you in the land where you are entering to possess it. But if... You, if your heart turns away and you do not obey, but rather draw, are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land which you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess it. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursings. So choose life in order that you may live you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, Yahweh your God, by obeying His voice and holding fast to Him. For this is your life and the length of your days, that you may live in the land which the Yahweh swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to give them. I mean, it's just crystal clear, isn't it? We are to choose. We have to choose in accepting God's deliverance. He wants to. He longs to be gracious to us. We must allow him to do so by being obedient to his commands. Many times God has, you know, I, I thought of this today. Many times God has prevented us from sickness because we've been living for him and living with him. And again, not perfectly, but, you know, just doing the best that we know how. And, and he's, he's offset a lot of sickness and a lot of misery and a lot of heartache for us that we don't even know about. I was thinking of when Israel, Israel came out of... Uh, Egypt, and you have that whole record in Numbers about Balak and Balaam, and how Balak is trying to get Balaam to curse Israel, and yet God is intervening, and God is intervening, and Israel doesn't know anything about this. They're totally oblivious to how God is protecting them. And I'm sure he's done that for us in our lives. I, I, I've told you this story when I came back from Africa one year after ministering to so many people, and, and uh, one of the people I, pr I prayed for was a woman who had uh, TB. And uh, when I came back home, I took a physical, and uh, you know, I, uh, an annual physical, uh, you know, with your 
general practitioner, and, and uh, they gave me a TB. I don't know. They took my blood. That's what, how do they figure it out? What? Oh, oh, Mimi, you asked me specifically to, to get a shot because we have all these grandchildren. She asked me to check for TB. And, you know, the nurse comes in, and she's, she's, she looks at the thing. I guess you have to wait a couple of days or something. I don't remember what happened. And, and she comes in, she looks at it, and she says, oh, I'll be right back. And she leaves, and then that was one of the uh, nurse practitioners, I guess. And then she went and got the head nurse, and then the, the head nurse comes in. She looks at me, and she says, oh, I'll be right back. I've got to go to get the doctor. I'm saying, what the heck is going on here, you know? And then uh, Charlie comes in, the do my, my doctor, and says, look, you know, Chuck knows Charlie. We have, we're buddies with Charlie. So uh, Charlie says, look, it looks like you had, you had TB. He said, and, uh, don't get nervous, Vince. It doesn't, it doesn't look like you have it. It looks like you had it. You don't have it now. And, you know, so I don't, you know, I apparently got it from her, but God took care of it before I got home, at least before I got the test, because God knew how much I was afraid that Mimi was going to beat me up for coming home with TB. <laughs> so he saved my... <laughs> and I think that that happens to us a lot, and we don't know all that God does for us in keeping us healthy. And God heals all of us all the time. I mean, you know, we get a cold, and it goes away. Thank God, right? I mean, you get bronchitis, you think you're going to die with it, but eventually it goes away. We do get healed all the time. He's made it so that health is a part of, of, uh, of our, our life. And who knows what he's spared us from. Now, can we go to Proverbs? Isaiah is way beyond where Proverbs is. You have Psalms, Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs, Psalms in the middle of your Bible. Proverbs 1. Proverbs chapter 1. <laughs> Come on. 129. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of Yahweh, they would not accept my counsel. They spawn, how do you say that? Spurned? Spawned? Spurned. Spurned all my reproof. So they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be, sati, sa, be what? satiated with their own devices. Well, they didn't want to listen to me. Okay, now they're able to do what they want. They're going to live with their own devices. You know, they, they had no end of a desire to do what they wanted to do, and now they will. That's the way it works. He's not going to prevent any of us. So they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be satiated with their devices for the waywardness of their, for the waywardness of their naive. Why am I having a hard time with these words? We'll kill them. And the complacency of fools will destroy them. But he who listens to me shall live sh securely and will be eased from the dread of evil. So do what he says. Just do what he says. Lamentations, I think I have that. Where I have that? I thought I had that. Yeah, there it is. No, I don't. Yes, I do. No, I don't. <laughs> Lamentations. Turn to that, please. Chapter 3. There it is. I do have it up on the board. I didn't want. I knew you wouldn't. It would take you too long to find it. It took me an hour to find it myself. In Lamentations three, why should any living mortal or any man offer a complaint in view of his sins? <laughs> you got to think about that. I mean, you got all these consequences in your life, and you're going to complain about it as if you had nothing to do with it. It reminds me of the time when, when I was a, a, a rebellious teen. <laughs> the police officer pulled me over again, and uh, I forget what we did wrong this time, but I do remember what happened. He, he told us, I think he, there was two of them, the one of them told me to put, put my hands behind my back. They wanted to put uh, bracelets on me. And, and uh, I, said to the, I said to the cop, no, I'm not going to do it. So he poked me in the stomach with the, uh, the nightstick, you know, and oh. And then he said, now put your hands behind your back. I said, no. And he poked me again. This went on forever. I mean, I really taught him a lesson, didn't I? <laughs> That's how stupid we get. 
right? Just live according to the scripture and do what it says, and you can have the abundance of blessings that are provided by it. If you want to go your own way, you suffer that. And then, you know, you get, a, you get <laughs> my head was, I went home complaining to all my friends about how mean the cops were. You know, like they did something wrong. <laughs> Let us explain and probe our ways. There's an idea. Let us examine and probe our ways. And let us return to Yahweh. We lift up our heart and our hands towards God in heaven. Just surrender. Lift up your hands and give up. Acknowledge that his way is better than your way. Just surrender. I think that's what the police officer wanted me to do. Not to fight it, just give up. Look at Malachi, please. Malachi. That's the last book of the Old Testament. One of the, one of the uh, I wanted to remind you of some of the things we've looked at before when we talk about, we talk about being obedient to the commandments, that God would give us a way of life, that, that God would give us the right way to live right, life and show us the proper, the proper benefits and, and, you know, how to do things the right way. Uh, we shouldn't resist that and be rebellious to it. We should understand that as a gift from God, that it's His grace. By His grace, He makes promises. By His grace, He gives us commands. By His grace, He shows us the way to live. It's our responsibility to listen. If we listen to what He has to say, and then we have faith, which means we obey. We do what He says to do. And then we'll receive the, the blessings that He promises. It's just a very, very simple formula. We're talking now in Malachi, right before Matthew. Yes, right before Matthew. If you can find the New Testament, then you'll find it. Malachi. Chapter 3. In verse 6, it says, For I, Yahweh, do not change. So what I've been reading to you here hasn't changed. This, this principle of truth doesn't change. But this is the context that he's talking about here is, Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Verse 7, For the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says Yahweh of hosts. But you say, How shall we return? Verse 8, Will a man rob God? Yet you have, you have been robbing me. But you say, how have we been robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you, have, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there will be, be food in my house. And test me now. Test me. He says, test me now. Test me. Put me to the test now. Is this, as the Lord Yahweh of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows, then I will rebuke the devourer for, your, for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your ground, nor will your vine in your fields cast its grapes, says Yahweh of hosts. And all the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land." says the Lord of hosts. So what he's saying here is if, if you tithe, if you do as I've told you to do, then I'm going to bless you for it. I'm going to open up the windows of heaven and pour out a, a blessing in which there's not room enough to receive. And I, I like the way the King James says this better than the NASB, verse 11. I will rebuke the devourer the devour for your sake, and I will destroy so that it... Well, that's it. That's, that's good, too. I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that it will not destroy the fruits of your ground. Talking about the devil, he's going to rebuke the devourer for our sakes if we trust him in this, in this realm. It says similar to, in this, uh, to Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 3. Gee, I could have told you to stay there earlier, but he didn't. Proverbs chapter 3. We talk about health and, and, and uh, you know, God's blessings in our life. This is one of those things. I learned this very early on in my Christian faith. I worked this through in my mind, and I, 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 could, I could relate to this because of my, my upbringing. You know, you, 
I, I didn't view it the right way, but I, 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 I did understand it. And that if, if I tried God in this way, um, if I would prove God by tithing, by giving of my finances, that he would do what he promised to do. And indeed, he's, he, this is 40-something years later, and it's still been the case of my life. 3.1, my son, do not forget my teachings. Let your heart keep my commandments. 4, length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. So that's pretty clear, isn't it? You want to have a good, long life, healthy life with peace? Do what God says to do. Do not let kindness, do not let kindness and the truth leave you. Bind them about your neck. Write them on the table of your heart. Keep the word before you. So you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear Yahweh and turn away from evil. It will be, it will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruit of your produce. So your bonds will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. It's a very simple principle. If you want God's blessing, trust Him. Do His will. Try giving. Prove Him and see if He does not bless you back. Now, Jesus had great insight and great, um, had a great ministry of healing, obviously unparalleled by anybody ever. But we, we see in His teaching ministry or in His ministry that teaching preceded quite often the healing. I have written in your notes there, Matthew 4, 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I had showed you the verses that follow in a previous session that he went about healing everybody. He said, Repent, for the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Jesus' healing ministry, so often he taught the kingdom of God and the necessity for repentance. You know what repentance means? That's a religious word for a simple word, which means change. Change. Just change. Don't, you know, you're going in a certain direction, go in a different direction. Repent. Change. And then, after that, after you did this teaching about the kingdom, in light of the coming kingdom and living in the way that we should in light of that, repentant, and then the healing comes. We must eliminate all the sin before... If, now, in your notes again, if we must eliminate, I want to give balance to what I'm teaching tonight. If we must eliminate all sin before we are healed, then we will be forever sick. It's not going to happen, and that's not what I'm talking about. I mean, it's, ju it's just not realistic. But also, we need to acknowledge that habitual sin, a lifestyle of sin, must be eliminated if we want God's grace and mercy to work in our lives to receive the healing and the abundance that He provides for us. Look at Psalm 38. Psalm 38. It's a Psalm of David. Psalm 38. O oh Lord, rebuke me not in your wrath, and chasten me not in your burning anger. 38.2 For your arrows have sunk deep into me, and your hand has pressed down on me. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head, as a heavy burden, they weigh too much for me. My wounds grow foul and fester because of my folly. He acknowledges that it was his sin, his, you know, what he was doing wrong. I am bent over and greatly bowed down. I go mourning all day long. My loins are filled with burning, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am benumbed. And madly crushed, I groan because of agitation of my heart. Lord, all my desire is before you, 
and my sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs, my strength fails me, and the light of my eyes, even that has gone from me. My loved ones and my friends stand aloof from my plague, and my kinsmen stand afar off. Those who seek my life lay snares before me. Those who seek to injure me have threatened destruction, and they have devised treachery all the day long. But I, like a deaf man, do not hear. I am like a mute man who does not open his mouth. Yes, I am like a man who does not hear and in whose mouth are no arguments. For I hope in you. He doesn't get into a contest with these other people. He's a mute to them. He doesn't hear what they're saying because his hope is in Yahweh. You will answer, O Lord my God. For I say, may they not rejoice over me, whom when they, my foot slips would magnify themselves against me. For I am ready to fall, and my sorrow is continually before me. For I confess my iniquity. I am full of anxiety because of my sin. But my enemies are vigorous and strong, and many are those who hate me wrongfully. And those who repay evil for good, they oppose me because I follow what is good. Do not forsake me, O Lord, O my God. Do not be far from me. Make haste to help me. O oh Lord, my salvation. It's a really mixed psalm. This is a guy really pouring out his heart. But he's, he's got the wisdom to understand that part of the problem that he has is the sin. And he confessed his sin before God. Not, not, I'm not trying to, to say that every problem that is ours in our lives is because of sin. That isn't the, that isn't the case. There are times that we get sick because of the environment that we live in. There's times that we get sick because you shake hands with somebody who just coughed in their hands and they have germs on their hands and then you put it in your mouth. There's times that you get sick because of the food that you eat. There's times that you get sick because of the environment that you're in. There's some, there's some times that, you know, the genetics that, that we have, the genetic makeup that we have from, from our gene pool. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of different reasons, but we, we can't ignore this either. This is a very real thing that we're talking about here tonight. Not the only, but it's something, it's actually, it's something that we, we can detect and do something about. We can decide to live the right way, and when we sin, confess the sin and start living the right way and doing it the right way. I, that's why I love, that's what I, I tried to say earlier, but that's why I love the tithe. I felt it was something I could do. It wasn't, it wasn't something I couldn't see. It was something I could see. Money, I understood money was right in front of me. You're saying we give 10% of that and then this blessing will come. I could, I could relate to that. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne. That's just the fact. But also loving kindness and truth go before him. And a lot of times we have seen that God shows mercy to people who don't deserve mercy. I mean, it wasn't because Naaman was good enough that he got healed. He was, an, he was a heathen. He didn't believe in the one true God. He didn't do anything. The only thing he did was do what God, fi finally, after arguing, he went and jumped in the river seven times. Other than that, then he became a believer. You know, it wasn't because he was a believer. And the dead guy that was being hauled out of town by, with his mother leading, that dead guy didn't do anything for Jesus to go up and raise him from the dead because he, he couldn't do anything. He was dead. You know, or the, or the ten lepers, the ten leprous men that got healed and only the one came back and was thankful and glorified God. The other nine went their way and could care less. So there's, there's record after record of exception, but nonetheless, we don't want to violate that which is so pointedly real in the Scriptures, that if you want God's blessing in your life, do what He says. If you want health, do it the way He says to do it. You want a healthy life. In Psalm 107 in your notes, well, also before we read that, much sickness is directly linked to our sin, and we can, we can see this today. I mean, this isn't something that's not seeable. ST, what do they call them? STDs, you know, sexual transmitted diseases. I mean, if, if people, and AIDS, I mean, and these type of things, I mean, these wouldn't happen if people, this wouldn't happen to anybody who was obeying the commandments. There, is a, there are parameters to sex that if we would be obedient to them, these would never be an issue for anybody. But, you know, 
Same thing with, with gluttony, you know, lusting after food or lusting after alcohol, or lusting after drugs. This stuff has an impact on your physical body. I mean, it's just logic. So, you know, you want to change those things. As is true with hate and bitterness and anger and, van and, and vengeance, this kind of sour stuff releases negative chemicals in our bodies that poison our body. You know, you can't, you can't, if you, if you, you can't have hatred and get away with it, it and, and bitterness and, and, and all this nonsense. It just releases terrible things. And you, you know, you have all this towards another person who goes away. They don't even know you have it. They could care less. You're killing yourself. You know, and you know what I'm talking about. You've, you've, you've done this. You know, you, you just get so angry. You can feel the juices in your stomach. The elevator starts going up, you know, and, and you know, you're torturing yourself. Stop it. That's not what God tells you to do. He says, let it go. So, I mean, it is, it is available to see. <laughs> but I, I, people don't see, though. I mean, <laughs> people don't see. I mean, John and I were talking about this last night. Is it last night that, you know, Pat Robinson uh, came out on, on what's it, the 700 Club, and he said that AIDS was a direct, re a direct consequence of homosexual behavior. And you would have thought he raped somebody on TV because he was so bitterly attacked because he made that statement. Well, it's the truth. That's where it came from. It's not, a, it's not bad because it's, I mean, because it may be everybody in Hollywood thinks it's a good thing to be homosexual today. Well, you know, years ago, the people in Hollywood, Hollywood thought it was a good thing to be a communist, too. It was this whole big thing. Of course, you don't remember. This is years ago. You know, it was the vogue thing to be a communist. In, and meantime, the communists were killing millions and millions and millions of people. But the people in Hollywood thought it was cool to be a communist. And now the people in Hollywood think it's cool to be a homosexual. And, and they promote this. And I, I, I'm picking on Hollywood because they're the ones that have the biggest mouth that has the biggest impact that even influences the government to pass laws to say this is our... And if we can't get through our heads that jamming your penis in someone's butt is wrong, I mean, come on. I'm, uh, is that too graphic for you? Well, it should be that graphic. It should be that obvious that this is not right. Of course there's going to be consequences to this wrong behavior. Of course there's going to be consequences. But we don't, we don't put it together because it's not socially, it's not politically correct to talk this way. You know, we, we don't want to offend people. Oh, I, I, okay, let's not offend people. Let's have everybody like us on their way to hell and sickness and disease. Oh, Vince, you're off track a little bit. <laughs> Look at John chapter 9. I don't think so. In Psalm 107, it says, Fools, because of their rebellious ways and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all kinds of food. They draw near to the gates of death. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and He saves them out of their distresses. He sent His word to heal them and to deliver them from their destructions. <laughs> Sickness is, a, is an issue for everybody. Sometime or another. Even computers have viruses. Even, crookie, even cookies crumble. You know, f f well, while I'm on a roll here, you know, you know why frogs are happy? Because they eat the things that bug them. You know why frogs are happy? They eat the things that bugs them. You know, they eat bugs. You mean you got it and that was your response? Now I'm really upset. In John chapter 9, verse 1, As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he, sh that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, you know, they saw somebody blind, and their question was, who sinned, their parents or the guy. Well, how could the guy sin if he was born blind? He, he sinned in the womb? <laughs> Punched his mother or something? They believed, apparently, there was the doctrine of reincarnation that was going on or whatever. And Jesus said, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents. Here's the issue, but it was that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Neither night is coming when no one 
can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. What Jesus, what Jesus did was he diverted their question to the more important issue. Their question was, who sinned that this guy got sick? Jesus diverted it to the more important issue. Keep your eye on me because I'm going to heal him. That's really the important thing. I mean, it's good to know where our sin comes from. I mean, where our sickness comes from, especially if it's, if it's something that we can alleviate. But it's not always identifiable. We don't always know. It's not always because, I'm not sick always because I sinned. I can ask God, is this the direct result of something I've done wrong in my life? And we should ask God. And if God says, if He helps you, He presses on your heart, yeah, this is what you're doing wrong, then repent and stop doing it. Or if it's contrary, you know, if I'm living a life of, you know, if I'm, I'm putting heroin in my arms, I should realize that this is going to make me sick. You know, and obvious declarations, but my point is, in going to this John thing, not all sickness is the direct result of someone sinning. Although all sickness is the result of the original sin. Had Adam and Eve never sinned, nobody would have ever gotten sick. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that I've done something wrong because my child is born with a handicap, or I've done something wrong because I'm sick, or I've done something wrong because I'm not healed yet. I don't know the answers to all those questions, and you don't either. And that's why Jesus diverted it away from that and said, look, this is what you should be looking at. This is why in the book of Job, book, the book of Job is so revealing, because in, in Job has got this terrible plight that's happened to him. Everything's fallen apart. He's lost all his money. He's lost all his belongings. He's, you know, he's lost all his kids, and he's sick beyond imagination. And now he has these comforters that come to him, these three, what he calls later on, miserable comforters, and they're trying to figure out why all this has happened to Job. They're psychoanalyzing that this is something that you did in your past, this is something in your child, you're sinning here somewhere. They go through all of this psychoanalyzing, and Job himself, you know, is holding on to his perspective on it. And the end, God says, look, Job, you don't know what's going on. You know, look at me. Get your eyes on me. And then God talks to him for like three chapters about all the great things that he did. He gets his focus not on the problem, but on the solution. And then God heals him. And God never did tell him why all that happened to him. He, as far as I read the book, he never did figure out why all that happened to him. It said in the beginning of the book that he was a righteous man. There was none more righteous than him in all the land. And yet all this befell him. Of course, we know because we read the scripture that Satan did all of that. And Satan does cause sickness and problems at times. So we can't automatically conclude that it is a consequence of our wrongdoing. But either way, as Gail once said, the solution's the same. And that is, get your eyes on Yahweh, the healer, who can deliver you and who provides snacks when it's time to take a break. <laughs>